anger has erupted among tenants of a Chinese apartment rental company. That's after the company's funding chain cut off, prompting landlords to send their residents packing. A former president of a provincial high court has been convicted of accepting $10 million in bribes. Though he's now awaiting his sentence, the trial overlooked an even bigger crime. U.S. tech giant Apple asks one of its major suppliers to move production lines out of China. It's the result of the U.S.'s tough stance on the Chinese Communist Party. Two Chinese apps are sending the data of Android phone users to China. The apps have tens or hundreds of millions of users globally. And why don't the Chinese people stand up against the Chinese regime? Two factors play key roles in the answer. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A long-term rental apartment agency in China is facing extreme backlash. That's after the company's lack of funding led landlords to drive out occupants, despite the tenants paying their dues. Recent reports have emerged about long-term apartment service provider Exhale Apartment and the company's apparent lack of funding. As a result, many tenants have been driven out of their rented homes by landlords across the country. Eggshell Apartment was officially listed on the New York Stock Exchange this January. According to reports, it's the largest long-term rental company listed to date. The agency claims to have more than 400,000 apartments in China and serve more than 1 million renters. But now its funding chain is broken. The company now lacks the ability to pay the rent it owes the building landlords. As a result, some renters have been driven out of their homes, while others have had their water, internet or gas cut off. One tenant posted a request for help, saying there have been many violent conflicts between tenants and landlords across the country, and now the police and the regime are trying to ignore it. In one viral video, a woman who was driven out of her apartment by her landlord is seen holding a knife in an attempt to defend her rights. Another clip shows a tenant who climbed to the top of a high-rise building and prepared to jump. I have no water at home, and the eggshell apartment company is not solving the problem. I don't know why its funding chain broke. The company may have taken the rent for investing in other businesses, but didn't get the expected return. Eggshell Apartment asked its tenants to pay annually in advance, while it paid its rent to building landlords monthly. Eggshell also required its renters to sign a contract, which is actually a rent loan. That's so the bank would grant the company loans each year but Eggshell would instead pay the bank monthly. Now with the broken funding chain, the company's debt has been piled onto tenants' shoulders. Renter Ms. Fu told us most of Eggshell Apartments' renters are young people who are just starting their careers. In other words, people who don't have much savings to fall back on. The company asked renters to sign a contract. Renters didn't know what they signed was actually a rent loan. Then after the renters had signed, the company told them it was a rent loan. We don't even know that the company would use such a hidden trick. Renters also explained to us that calling the police doesn't do any good. That's because officers are refusing to address the issue, instead telling renters to work out the problem themselves. Reporting by Xiongbing, NTD News. Now we look to a corruption case in China's judicial system. Zhang Jian is the former president of a province-level high court in China's Anhui province. He was tried for bribery on Thursday. Over a 15-year period, he accepted bribes totaling $10 million while working for the judicial departments of Hubei and Anhui provinces. Zhang pleaded guilty. He's set to receive his sentence at a later date. But one crime wasn't tried during his court proceedings. Zhang is also known to have actively followed former Communist Party head Jiang Zemin and his efforts to persecute Falun Gong, a spiritual meditation discipline. The practice promotes the three principles of truthfulness, compassion and tolerance. Zhang served as director and deputy director of Hubei's Department of Justice for eight years. During that time, around 170 Falun Gong practitioners died as a result of the regime's persecution. They had been detained in prisons, labor camps, detention centers, and brainwashing centers. This, according to Minghui.org, a U.S.-based website dedicated to reporting on the global Falun Gong community. In 1999, the Chinese regime initiated a crackdown on Falun Gong, aiming to eradicate it from China. Under Zhang's jurisdiction, the so-called Hubei Legal Education Institute has been used as a center for brainwashing Falun Gong practitioners. 
Brainwashing is one of the primary tools used to force Falun Gong practitioners to renounce their faith. If they refuse to give up the practice, they can also be illegally detained for long periods of time without a trial. This so-called Education Institute first opened in April 2002. By 2009, it held six brainwashing class sessions every year. Each class was made up of 20 to 50 Falun Gong practitioners. As part of the sessions, they were forced to watch videos slandering the practice and desecrate photos of Falun Gong's founder. Physical torture methods are also widely used to help coerce recipients into changing their views. That means more than 1,000 Falun Gong practitioners have been illegally detained in that center alone. And reports show these kinds of facilities have been built up across China. A steady stream of reports have emerged detailing death cases from inside these centers. Amid the Sino-U.S. trade war and the pandemic, more companies are taking their business out of China. The most recent company to join the movement is U.S. tech giant Apple. NTD's Don Ma has the story. Tech company Apple Inc. is moving one of its major assembly lines out of China. This is due to concerns amid the U.S.-China trade war. An unnamed source told Reuters that Apple on Thursday requested its major manufacturing supplier Foxconn move iPad and MacBook assembly lines out of China and to Vietnam. An assembly plant is being built there that's set to come online in the first half of 2021. Taiwan-based Foxconn is one of the world's largest electronics manufacturing services. It has more factories in China than in any other country. That's 12 factories across nine cities. It's one of Apple's oldest and largest suppliers and builds most of Apple's iPhones. The source also added, the move was requested by Apple. It wants to diversify production following the trade war. The U.S. has imposed high import tariffs on electronics made in China. It's also restricted supplies of U.S.-made components from being sent to Chinese firms. Foxconn declined a request for comment from Reuters. In July, sources with knowledge of the matter told Reuters that Foxconn plans to spend up to $1 billion expanding an iPhone assembly plant in India. The move was reportedly strongly requested by Apple. It appears to be an effort to diversify production and move away from relying solely on China. Earlier this week, researchers claimed that two apps from Chinese tech giant Baidu were leaking sensitive user data. This meant Baidu's users could be exposed to surveillance or cybercrime. Google took Baidu Maps in the Baidu app off the Google Play Store last month, thanking the researchers for disclosing privacy issues in the software. The apps have tens or hundreds of millions of users globally, with six million in the U.S. alone. Researchers at Palo Alto Networks Unit 42 said a software development kit in the apps was sending sensitive user data to a Chinese server. And it could happen to anyone who downloaded the apps on their Android phone. The Trump administration has granted ByteDance another extension. The Chinese company now has seven more days from tomorrow to sell its short video sharing app TikTok. That's according to a court filing. President Trump signed an executive order in August giving ByteDance 90 days to sell TikTok to American buyers. That deadline was due to expire in November, and this latest extension to December 4th is the second one the U.S. has granted. U.S. authorities said on Wednesday they were reviewing a revised submission from ByteDance to divest TikTok. If that proposed deal is rejected, TikTok could effectively be banned by the U.S. Bloomberg reports that British drug maker AstraZeneca will likely do another study to assess the efficacy of its CCP virus vaccine. The company came under scrutiny after scientists raised questions about the result of its vaccine trial. On Monday, AstraZeneca said its experimental vaccine developed with Oxford University prevented 70 percent of CCP virus cases on average in late-stage trials. But it was based on the results of two subgroups. The first group was given two full doses one month apart, which showed an efficacy of 62 percent. The other group received a half dose, followed by a full dose, and it was 90 percent effective. The second group, the one with a higher efficacy, is smaller, with 2,071 volunteers. And according to the chief scientific advisor for Operation Warp Speed, it's also limited to people 55 years and younger a group with lower risk to the virus. 
The Financial Times reports the age breakdown wasn't included in AstraZeneca's results, which were released on Monday. Some experts say this could hinder the vaccine's chances of getting speedy approval from U.S. and EU regulators. U.S. regulators require a 50 percent efficacy to approve a vaccine. In response, AstraZeneca says the administering of the half dose was reviewed and approved by the U.K. regulator, and they look forward to peer review results. The Food and Drug Administration has not commented on AstraZeneca's vaccine trial results. Earlier this week, a panel of CDC advisors said patients should be warned about the potential side effects of a CCP virus vaccine. There are concerns that if people got the first shot and have an adverse reaction, they might not want to go back for the second one. One doctor said patients should be made aware that this is not going to be a walk in the park. Leaked documents from China show the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, is trying to infiltrate other countries through local trade associations. One such association in Australia has been playing a significant role in building bridges between the CCP and the Australian local government. The Australia International Trade Association is actually a tool of the CCP's united front. All activities of the association evolve around the interaction between various levels of government as well as industries in China and Australia. Documents we obtained from the Foreign Affairs Office of the Huainan Municipal Government in Anhui Province show the association has been actively promoting China's Belt and Road Initiative, an infrastructure investment project known to extend Beijing's overseas influence. The association issued an invitation letter last year, inviting the Huainan city governments to participate in a forum held by the parliaments of Australia State Victoria, the forum was about the Belt and Road Initiative and sister city partnerships between China and Australia. Another letter from last year issued by the association showed it would organize a delegation in Australia to visit Huainan City. In the letter, the chief executive officer of the association, Michael Guo, along with the mayor of Pyrenees, Robert Vance, requested a meeting with officials from Huainan City, including its mayor. The meeting was to discuss the establishment of sister cities and to promote CCP's Belt and Road Initiative in Australia and New Zealand. The same month, the local government of Victoria and the communist regime signed the Belt and Road Initiative Agreement. In June this year, Australia Prime Minister Scott Morrison criticized Victoria for violating Australia's national interests. Australian Chinese scholar Zhang Xiaogan said, China uses various methods of bribery to corrupt Australian officials at all levels. When it is really necessary to consider the national interest, he shrugs it off by saying that he has to talk to the federal government. But when he gets his own private interest, he won't talk about the federal authority. He just takes it all for himself. So this kind of thing is a loophole for the Chinese Communist Party to take advantage of and to export its corruption to Australia. This loophole must be plugged. According to his official website, the CEO Guo was originally from Beijing and moved to Australia in the 1980s. In addition to proactively promoting the CCP's One Belt, One Road initiative, Guo has arranged or accompanied officials from China and Australia to exchange visits every year for the past few years. There are more than 100 sister city partnerships between China and Australia. The association said it had facilitated the establishment of 60 of them. Sister city relations seems to deal with cultural and economic issues, but the CCP used it to increase its influence or even to spy on other countries. Uh, Michael, Guo. Michael Guo's actions are in fact the CCP's conventional methods of united front behavior. In particular, the reputation of the China Council for the Promotion of Peaceful National Reunification is already very bad. Therefore, the CCP tries its best to put forward united front tools in the form of a trade association. Those tools are ranked as more important in this sister city relationship. There are many, many hidden transactions behind the scenes. A current affair commentator in the United States, Zheng Haochen, said similar institutions exist in all countries, especially in large Western countries. It's actually not difficult to identify these institutions. One is to check their background, the other is to check their source of funds. As long as there is no specific business operation and the source of the money is unknown, they could well be CCP institutions. The Australia International Trade Association was blacklisted by the Howard government of Australia 12 years ago because of its abnormal relations with the Chinese Communist Party.
The former South Australian Superintendent Peter Madril had served as the executive officer of the association. Madril sued the association in 2005 and warned the Australian authorities about its relationships with the Chinese Communist Party. Reported by Wang Zhiqi, NTD News. Now we turn to a question of some viewers. They asked, why don't Chinese people all stand up and fight? The key words to answer this are fear and the economy. If you ask this question to any Chinese person who has lived through the Chinese Communist Party's history of killing in its political or cultural movement, that's the answer you are most likely to get. Wang Dan was a leader of the big pro-democracy student protests in Beijing in 1989. In a Radio Free Asia interview, he said fear is the fundamental reason for Chinese people not fighting back. In China, any expression of dissatisfaction or protest can lead to suppression by the authorities and even arrest. One example of the high-handedness of the authorities is the control of speech. The world already knows that Dr. Li Wenliang was warred and silenced by police simply because he messaged his circle of friends about the Chinese Communist Party or CCP virus on Chinese messaging platform WeChat. That was because the CCP wanted to cover up the outbreak. Big Brother is watching every single person in that country. Even when you want to buy a kitchen knife in China, you have to be registered for it. The chips embedded in the ID or citizenship card record every move. The information they give upon being scanned decides whether you can buy a train ticket or not. And the widely used Sky Eye surveillance system enables the police to locate anyone as quickly as in seven minutes. That's according to a BBC reporter's field test. The authorities will also do background checks for education and employment to make sure you haven't done anything that the government is against. If you have, it's not only you, but your family members, your parents, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters that will likely become involved and be punished. Unless someone has the courage to fight alone against the tyranny of the CCP, most choose to remain silent. Another backbone holding up the CCP's power and control over people is economic growth. Seventy years ago, the CCP cut off China's connections to the outside world and started political movements in order to, as they said, realize socialism and even communism. This drove China's economy to the brink of collapse. Forty years ago, the CCP had no other option but to open the country up again. And other countries brought huge amounts of money to China through investment and economic interactions. But the CCP's propaganda organs are telling Chinese people day after day that they now have a better life only because of the so-called wise leadership of the CCP and that they should be grateful to the party. Many people in China believe it's the CCP that pays their salary. They believe the CCP's narrative because they have no other sources for information. And that's all for today's China In Focus. Thanks for watching. And from all of us here at China In Focus, happy Thanksgiving and see you tomorrow.